Hi everyone, and welcome to this month's Wildlife Wednesday Roundup. I'm your host, Tenley Thompson, and boy have we got some great footage to show you from the last month of all the great wildlife opportunities we've been having in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Let's start by checking in with guides Laura and Tyler as they give us the latest on Grand Teton National Park's grizzly bears. We're thrilled to announce that grizzly bear number 399 and her four cubs have emerged safe and healthy from their den. So we've been seeing them in their typical spots up in the park this month. <laughs> grizzly bears and black bears eat a variety of foods in the spring. You know, first off, carcasses, because why not eat something that's already dead? Next, sometimes they'll eat elk calves, which I know is kind of sad, but elk are creatures of habit, so they return back to the same areas every spring, and grizzly bears know to key into those um, tasty little morsels. They'll also eat grass, which to me is really surprising to see a massive grizzly bear just grazing like a cow in a field. But green grass is one of the most nutrient rich food resources in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So grizzly bears and black bears are, are happy to eat those green grasses, as well as bird eggs. <laughs> now who wouldn't enjoy a good omelet? Uh, we have some ground nesting birds around here as well as um, tree nesting birds. So, you know, grizzly bears and black bears might be raiding those nests. <laughs> um, also insects or ants. <laughs> Recently I saw a grizzly bear using his paws to overturn rocks to find likely ants down beneath those rocks, <laughs> which they can easily just lick up. Uh, grizzly bears are creatures of habit. They return back to the same places each and every year, which I think is really interesting. If I check my calendar and check my videos and photo from exactly a year ago, the, the same bear might be in the same location, which is so cool. Um, recently, some of the, the cubs have been leaving their mother's side. They've been going off on their own for the first time in their life. So mama bear, of course, was charged with teaching her cubs about where to find good good food but um, now they have to go off and do it on their own um, for especially male cubs it could mean leaving their mother's side um, for quite a distance some bears might travel hundreds of miles from from their mother's territory to a new place I recently heard about a grizzly bear down in the southern area of the Wyoming range that's you know outside normal bear grizzly habitat but you know, bears are spreading out. Their population is uh, rebounding really well in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. That means heading off into new places. So just a reminder to keep your food in bear safe containers. We gotta keep our food away from the bears so that they don't get a tasty little snack <laughs> because you know, in the future, they're going to come back for more. And that could cause problems for the bears and for people uh, you know, in uh, other years. So yeah, if you're out camping, please just, you know, keep your cooler or keep your food uh, locked up. Even if you're camping in a place where you wouldn't expect to see a bear or a grizzly bear. Well, thanks. Please enjoy these great videos. I'm really excited to share them with you and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Hi everyone. I just wanted to give a big thanks to Laura for sharing some information on bear diet and biology. My name is Tyler Greenlee and today I want to talk a little bit about the individual bears that we have been seeing in Grand Teton National Park. May is a very busy bear season and we have had a plethora of sightings on our recent tours. Among the bear seen include grizzly bear 399. She has been spending a large amount of time traversing the open meadows and glades in Grand Teton National Park. There she's feeding largely on the grass and insects that Laura mentioned. However, we are beginning to see a change in her diet as elk begin to give birth. Recently, one of our new guides, Raf, witnessed and photographed 399 taking down an elk calf. This might be hard for many of us to watch,
but we must be reminded that this is nature playing out before us, raw and true, as it has for millennia. Other bears recently seen in Grand Teton National Park includes Blondie's four-year-old offspring and 610's two-year-old cub. They have been spending quite a bit of time in each other's presence and there is a possibility that courtship is taking place. However, we won't know for certain until next spring. In addition to bears we recognize and see often, we were also surprised by many unknown bears, bears we have never seen before. This includes this female and her two koi or cubs of the year. There are many bears in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and we see many unfamiliar faces. This keeps things constantly interesting because you never know who you are going to see or what you will find when you're out on tour with EcoTour Adventures. Thanks everyone for tuning in. My name is Tyler Greenlee and see you next time on Wildlife Wednesday. Thanks Tyler. Really great updates from all of our grizzly bear families in Grand Teton National Park. We'll have more information on that for you later, including some information about one of grizzly bear 610's cubs over in the question and answer section, because I'm quite sure people have some questions about that. In the meantime, let's check in with one of my favorite parts of spring, which is the great migration and all of the amazing colorful, colorful birds and their feathers that we have going on in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem this time of year. Hi everyone, it's Tyler again. Before I was a wildlife guide, I actually studied birds. And one thing I find super interesting about birds, which might be their most obvious trait, are feathers. Feathers might seem trivial, but these structures are unparalleled in the natural world. Let's take a look at some of the most colorful birds and feathers in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and see how birds use these feathers to survive. Feathers provide birds with many things needed for survival, including warmth, durability, colors for a mate, and most obviously, flight. Like the wings of an airplane, bird feathers are strong and form a continuous plane to support birds in flight. However, when not in use, birds can fold their wings so they don't get in the way of more everyday tasks, such as feeding and roosting on branches. Feathers are also very easy to maintain. When the individual filaments of a feather fall apart or become frayed, birds can simply zip them up with their beaks. This is why we see birds cleaning or printing themselves so often. Besides being used to power flight, feathers also protect birds from the elements. Check out this video of harlequin ducks swimming in the Yellowstone River. The water in the Yellowstone River is only about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The feathers of the harlequin ducks provide them with warmth and safety from the turbidity of the rapids, as well as keeps them waterproof while they swim up and down the rapids, courting each other and looking for food. Feathers also help birds survive extremely hot temperatures. They're actually able to compress their feathers against their bodies, pushing out the little pockets of air that keep them warm when it's cold outside. In this way, feathers are extremely durable, waterproof. Birds can fluff them up to warm up and compress them down on their bodies to cool off. Feathers are also used for communication and many species rely on feathers when choosing a partner. Females actively select males with the brightest and cleanest feathers, hoping for the strongest, most reliable mate. However, having bright colors comes with a cost. They are expensive to produce, and it's easy for predators to spot you. So some male birds have developed survival techniques. They only produce colorful feathers for part of the year, and they use structural color instead of pigments. Producing colorful feathers for only part of the year helps keep you camouflaged and safe 
safe from your predators. That's why some birds only have beautiful bright colors for about three months of the year. Structural color is easier and less expensive to produce and allows feathers to tap into colors that they physically can't produce themselves. That includes the blue colors you see in a bluebird, or in this lazuli bunting, for example, or the iridescence that you see when you spot a hummingbird. Feathers have allowed birds to spread all across the world, and they provide our tours with a splash of color in an otherwise mammalian brown world. My name is Tyler Greenlee, and thanks everyone for tuning in to Wildlife Wednesday. Hey guys, Verlin here with Eco Tour Adventures. I'm out uh, partaking in one of my favorite activities, uh, looking for morel mushrooms. And we're finding a couple today. Uh, generally we find them early spring when soil temperatures reach about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if you look right here, I don't know if you can see them, but they sure blend in well. And on that note, you know, technically other mushrooms that you eat are uh, Basidiomyces family. Uh, they form blastids or fruit bodies, like your general mushroom. Whereas this here technically really isn't a mushroom, it's Ascomycete, which is more common or more, more closely related to your, your common bread molds and things like that. Um, so kind of interesting, um, kind of a debate there. But when you cut your morels, guys, you're always gonna wanna know they're hollow. Your false morels are gonna have kind of a, a white cottony layer in there. Um, and there's many different, dozens of different varieties of morels uh, across North America and the globe for that matter. Uh, and right here we have Morchella esculenta, um, which is the common blonde morel, my favorite of all. Um, they come all different varieties. Um, Morchella alata is the common black morel you'll usually find in the burn areas here, uh, along with, oh, about a half a dozen other varieties. Oh, hey again. Well, this is a good sign when you're looking for morels. Well, recently dead or dying trees, usually where you find massive flushes of morels. And when I say a flush, that's the technical term for, I guess, mushrooms growing. Uh, mushrooms being the fruit body of an organism that lives subterranean. Uh, the mycelial mat here uh, has probably formed a mycorrhizal relationship with this cottonwood tree and needs to go find a new host tree. So uh, back in the day, morels were always classified as saprophytes meaning they feed off of dead or decaying uh, materials, organic matter, um, which it's now believed that many morels are more so mycorrhizal. While they can't exist in a saprophytic state, it's really rare to find them in, in large numbers. However, they have these host trees, so they're living amongst that. The mycelium, which is the actual fungus itself, um, Oh, sometimes even looks a little bit like uh, shoe, shoe, shoelace strands. Um, a lot of time when these trees die or are, are ready to die, the mushroom or fungus, I should say, needs to go find a new host tree. Um, so to do that, they must reproduce by sending up that fruit body that we're picking here. Um, and here there's a bunch.
We got one there. And there. Another sneaky guy hiding over here. Whenever you find a morel, always be looking for others. Morels are pretty fun guys, and they usually have friends. Awesome. Thanks very much, Verlin. And sorry, everybody. Once again, as per usual, remember I promised I wouldn't use the mute button anymore? And I think I broke my promise. So no more mute button for me because even after a year of Zoom meetings, I have forgotten when I have it on. But I hope you all have enjoyed um, all of the videos from this month. Just a reminder, what I was saying before is that video was an anniversary of our one year of broadcasts. That was actually from Verlin from uh, last June 2020. And it was one of our favorite videos of the early series that we produced when we just started after the COVID pandemic, making these videos as a way to support our guides during the pandemic because they didn't know when they were gonna work again. How far we've come. Now it's June 2021 and Yellowstone is booming with visitors and we've got some great views for you guys in the coming days and weeks on our Facebook page, including a recent eruption of Steamboat, some great wolf activity that we've been enjoying as well up on our multi-days. And of course, we can't wait to show you lots more videos next month as well. All right, so it is my favorite time, um, second favorite time of the session, which is it's time for our trivia question of the month. Now, of course, to do that, we have to answer last month's trivia question first, uh, which comes to us from Kelsey. And the question was pretty simple, but I added sort of a more difficult element, which is, what is the name of this bird? What is the species of this bird? But also, if you want extra credit, I wanted to know how old this bird is because actually the way this bird looks, I did this on purpose to be sneaky and to try and fool you, um, is a little bit of a way to uh, make it hard to ID, but also the way this bird looks particularly that stripe over its eyes, is going to tell us a little bit about how old this bird is as well. So if you know the answer to our trivia question, go ahead and put it in the comment section. Now I will warn you guys, this is actually last month's trivia question. So we've already given out our prize. Um, so you don't have a chance to win, but you have a chance to win for this month's, which is coming up in just a moment. Go ahead and comment in the comment section if you know what bird this is and how old it is. All right. All right, some good guesses there in the comments section. Hopefully you all got a pretty good look and were able to figure things out. That is one of my favorite morphs of a juvenile bald eagle. Everybody thinks bald eagles are born with that white head and tail, but they're not. They're actually born quite dark, very similar looking in some ways to a golden eagle, and then they gradually lighten up that head with each molting and shedding of feathers throughout the season. So birds with that sort of dark eye stripe, what I call the bandit eye stripe, but other people call the osprey looking juvenile bald eagle because of course ospreys kind of have a similar look. Those birds are around three to three and a half years old, almost at their full plumage. Bald eagles actually get that full white head and full white tail at the age of four years. And so it's just about there. It's just got to shed the last of those juvenile uh, young sub-adult feathers and then it will be in full breeding plumage ready to find its mate for life and pair up for life and create little bald eagles of its own. So hopefully some of you guys got last, not last month, we didn't have a Wildlife Wednesday last month, the month before because we were we were training last month, but hopefully you got that last trivia question from Kelsey correct. All right, this month's trivia question is brought by some, of course, of our items from our web store. We started this web store right in the middle of COVID um, as a way to support our guides. If you'd like to help out our guides, 100% of the proceeds of our web store items go either towards the nonprofits they're partnered with or they go towards our staff. Um, we've got our brand new hats in our web store. They've got Eco Tour Adventures right on the side of them. We've got the bison, the bear, and check out this moose, super, super fun. Makes a good gift. If you'd like to support us and the guides, feel free to take a look at that. And of course, as always, if you've enjoyed some of these videos the guides have made for you this week, feel free to give us a tip 
Uh, but yeah, something along those lines that'll go towards our employee benefits and support them. So we really appreciate everybody who contributed this month, which is a lot of our guides uh, contributing a lot of that video. All right, so on that note, Laura, perennial favorite guide Laura, has this month's trivia question. And this one's pretty cool. She had a really rare sighting in Grand Teton National Park last week. Really rare. Something I've never personally seen in the park. And my question for you is really simple. What is the name of this animal? Now, I'll give you all some hints because you know me. I love to give hints. Uh... This was found, um, this animal is walking around on a beaver dam. Obviously, it's not a beaver. Very rare in Grand Teton National Park, but probably significantly more common before they were heavily hunted uh, earlier in the last century. So, if you know what animal that is... Go ahead and let us know in the comment section and you'll be entered to win a gift card to our Eco Tour Adventure store. Maybe you can even get one of those hats if you want, but certainly um, some stickers, books, all sorts of fun things. Definitely check it out. Maddie, who's moderating our comments section this week, will certainly give you all a link to that. And then, of course, guys, with that, it's time for my favorite part of every Wildlife Wednesday monthly roundup, which is I am here to answer your questions. So if you have a question for a naturalist, um, trained as a biologist about ecology or botany or biology or astronomy or whatever it is you want to ask. I'm here to answer your questions. Just go ahead and write them in the comment section. I'll try to get to them one by one. Now, guys, I'm reading them here on my iPad. So when you see me looking down, um, it's not because I'm being rude. It's because I'm reading your questions. So let me go ahead and see what everybody... Ooh, lots of correct answers in the comment section. You guys are doing really good today. Pretty awesome. Let me go ahead and uh, sort of start with the questions at the top. And we'll go ahead and we'll kind of go down the line. Let's see here. Oh, Betty says, uh, was there in 1975? I didn't see one bear. We were so upset. Betty, in 1975, depending on where you were, Grand Teton versus Yellowstone, you would have maybe seen some black bears. But grizzly bears were not really something we commonly saw in the park even, oh, 10 years ago. When I first started guiding in this industry, um, right around 2000 and uh, five two thousand six boy to see a grizzly was really an accomplishment they were very very rare in grand teton national park when i was a little girl we did have one grizzly bear come south out of yellowstone almost to the town of jackson was kind of hanging out near the town of kelly and it was one of the first grizzly bears that had been seen that far south in decades grizzly bear populations really plunged um, in the later half of the last century, and it was only with dramatic recovery efforts that we began to see grizzly bear populations grow in the early 90s and begin to do better. So not surprised, but I hope you'll come back and visit us. We have many, many more grizzlies to see. And of course, let's not forget our good friends, the black bears. Um, black bears are so much fun. And sometimes I think they get overshadowed in Grand Teton and Yellowstone by those grizzly bears. So thanks very much for that. Let's see here. Oh man, I think Jorge has the furthest away watching from, which is Argentina. If you're watching from further away, let me know. But really good to see you again. Thanks for tuning in. I know it's at a ridiculous hour, but I'm so glad you could make it. Let's see. Oh, Don says that morels are 50 bucks a pound in Illinois uh, or higher. Uh, which I certainly believe, uh, certainly some, some people do make money around here by going and picking morels. Um, although you can't do that in the national park, of course, in the national forests, uh, and selling them by the bucket to local restaurants. So if you get a chance to try a morel delicacy while you're here, definitely check it out. Locally grown, uh, you know, wild raised, pretty cool stuff. All right, let's see here. Mark says, did you see the video of people taking pictures too close to grizzly bears in Yellowstone or Grand Teton in the last month or so would serve as a great training video for novice visitors? Mark, what's really sad about that question is there's actually more than one of those videos going around. Um, I think the one you're probably referring to is the one that the National Park Service itself, uh, Yellowstone National Park, put out because they're actually searching for the woman who uh, was too close to a mother grizzly and her cubs. Um, 
right up in sort of the, the northwest corner of the lower loop of Yellowstone. Uh, I think, was it by Gibbon Falls? I want to say it was by Gibbon Falls, but I can't quite remember. Anyway, long story short, uh, the Park Service is actually seeking her out because she certainly was in violation of several wildlife protective laws uh, federal federal rules uh, certainly was closer than 100 yards from a grizzly bear which is what you always want to be um, not just want to be it's required to be so that's too bad there is another one going around of a grizzly bear bluff charging a park ranger I'm not as familiar with the let's say provenance of that um, it's been making the rounds on the internet lately but I think it might actually be from um, some time ago that bear um, is pretty heavily scarred and is not a bear that's familiar to me other than it looks a bit like a young Scarface. So I'm not sure exactly when that video is from, but same situation, people getting too close. And then of course that um, wildlife management official was the one who ended up having to deal with the consequences of getting charged. Um, everybody of course is fine in both of those, uh, but not good for either one of those grizzly bears to have to deal with people getting so close. Uh, I find that the best way to handle um, folks who are getting too close to wildlife, particularly people who are kind of loving bears to death, is education. Uh, you know, we believe really, really strongly in wildlife ethics here at uh, Ecotour Adventures. It's really important to us. And uh, guides know that if the, um, the watching of a bear or any other wildlife, moose is another big problem, moose jams, is getting to the point where it's unethical towards that animal, we just leave. We can't control everyone else's behavior. We're so fortunate that we have the wildlife brigade in the parks that do help with that. But we can control our own. We can take ourselves out of that situation. And I would encourage everybody else to consider the same thing. Um, you don't need to go to a bear jam to find a bear. There's plenty of bears out there that you can view really ethically in the wild. And it's a whole lot more fun to not have a crowd around you. Um, but yeah, definitely a difficult situation. There's a series actually of videos on YouTube and I'm not gonna ask Maddie to find it because I think it's a bit of a tricky one to find, but it's actually put out by the National Park Service of cases, uh, case after case after case of wildlife, particularly bison going after the public when they get too close to get pictures. And luckily everyone in that video survives and is fine. So it's kind of a fun video to watch because you can just kind of look at all the people being incredibly foolish. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a big issue out here. And as we see increased visitation to the parks, it's becoming a bigger issue. And um, it troubles us here at EcoTour quite a bit. We want to do the right thing. We want to educate public to do the right thing. We like to joke that if you're out on a tour with us with a trained naturalist, that's probably the safest place to be and it's the most ethical place to be because we're certainly not going to put ourselves in a place that's not safe for you and certainly not safe for the bear or fair to any of our wildlife. So great question. Let's see here. Lots of good questions. Let's see. Oh, Bill, you're asking a, um, a political question, a controversial question. Those, of course, are my favorite kind. Um, our goal is not to inflict my opinions on you. My goal is to give you the facts and give you enough information for you to generate your own opinions. I'm not here to tell you what I think. Uh, but the question, of course, would d decreasing a wolf population in a neighboring state affect the Yellowstone ecosystem? I assume you're referring, of course, to the... Um, the wolf legislation that's currently going through the state legislature in Montana and, and some of those laws that have been brought up in Montana. So there's a pretty strong bias against gray wolves in the Western United States, particularly Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. And the reason for that is because of course, uh, a cultural heritage that involves cattle uh, and, and freedom, but also because of the way that wolves were introduced. Sometimes it's hard to understand when you don't live in the West, the politics of the situation, but it's actually really interesting. Wolves are controversial in places like Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, not only because of um, unfounded fears of the animals, uh, myths and urban legends about them that create anxiety, but also because the reintroduction of the gray wolf was done against the will of the states. And so let me kind of put the really simple version of this together. But basically, uh, wolves are were listed as an endangered species by the federal government under the Endangered Species Act. That's a federal law. 
Um, and it basically supersedes local state laws. And if an animal is listed as an endangered species, then that means that it's managed by the federal government and ownership is actually removed from the state. So this seems kind of crazy, but um, and bear with me because I'm getting into legal minutia, but it's actually pretty fascinating. Animals are owned by the state in which they live. And it seems really strange that somebody would own a wild animal. Uh, but somebody has to be their legal guardian in the court system, right? So a good example of this is all of the deer in California are owned by the state of California. If nobody owned the deer, then anybody could go out and kill as many deer as they wanted. And uh, pretty soon uh, the deer would be an unmanaged resource and could be overutilized and then you wouldn't have any deer. Um, I know that seems unlikely, but that is our history as a country. We had a, a, a great depreciation of many of our game animals in all of the... United States because nobody was managing, nobody was taking care of them. So states legally own wildlife. And what the Endangered Species Act technically does is it removes ownership from the states and for a temporary period of time gives it to the federal government. This is done oftentimes with against the will of the states. And what that oftentimes means is that those states are then frustrated and angry about what's happened and determined to be opposed to anything that then happens with federal action. So when wolves were removed from the endangered species list and ownership was returned Turned to the states, um, it was done with certain restrictions on how many wolves could be hunted in those states and how those wolves were managed. What that basically means is that Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming don't like wolves as a state uh, because they're trying to make a point to the federal government that the government shouldn't have removed ownership of an animal from them. It's a federal rights versus states' rights issue that's spilled over into wildlife politics. It's kind of confusing. People sometimes get really confused about all the anger about wolves in the Western states, and it's not actually a lot of it about wolves at all. It's actually about politics and states' rights. Um, Montana is trying to make that abundantly clear. It also should be noted that the constituency of Montana, the majority of them are not in support of wolf reintroduction um, and the return of wolves to the state. And so when the state legislature acts um, with these very aggressive uh, anti-wolf legislation and laws, it's because they are acting on the will of their constituency. The rest of the nation may not agree on what Montana is doing. Um, I certainly am pretty unhappy about it. Uh, but they are sort of supporting the will of the majority in that regard, which is what we do in a democracy. The good news is now that wolves have been uh, reintroduced and recovered in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, definitely what Montana is doing will affect wolves. It will definitely affect uh, Yellowstone wolves. It will definitely affect the northern range of wolves. It will definitely affect wolves and their genetics as a whole. But wolves will survive. Uh, they won't be exterminated by what Montana's trying to do. Uh, it won't be good. There won't be any benefit from an ecological standpoint, but it'll score some political points for some of those politicians, which um, at the end of the day is kind of the purpose of what they're trying to do. So hopefully that gives you guys some clarity on all of this. There are good things and bad things about any animal out there. There are good things and bad things about grizzlies. There's good things and bad things about wolves. There's good things and bad things about elk or moose or deer or even river otters. At the end of the day, um, they're animals and it's our anthropomorphism and it's our placing emotions and feelings and legislation on them that oftentimes causes the controversy, not always the animals themselves. The reality of wolves are that they don't attack people. They really rarely go after livestock. And when they do, livestock owners are compensated, but that doesn't make it okay, of course. And that they are sustainable for the ecosystem. But we can go into that another time. We don't need to go on and on, but great question. Let's see here. Dawn asks, are male orcs, male, male orc, are male elk sporting headgear yet? Yes, they all have little velvety nubs sticking out, just little bits. The older an elk is, the more they're showing. And we even actually, if you scroll down on our Facebook page, or maybe Maddie will link to it, saw an elk with a really unusual growth the other day. Um, you know, antler growth is certainly a hormonally based thing, uh, primarily testosterone based. But also, it's a health of the animal-based thing. The older and healthier they are, the faster they grow that. Elk can grow up to an inch of bone a day. So yes, they're already getting started for the fall rut season. It's pretty great to see. Hopefully, we'll have some videos of that for you next month. Let's see here. Mike asks, how is the wolf population in Grand Teton? Wolf population in Grand Teton is stable. 
we had a couple rough years there where the population really had decreased. Certainly they are affected by hunting outside of the park and that is an issue. Uh, but in general, wolf population is doing pretty well in Grand Teton, and they are doing pretty well in Yellowstone. Certainly not at record numbers or historic numbers, but certainly stable. So um, we've already checked in with many of our wolf packs in Grand Teton. We've got some good pups to report uh, down here in the south, and then of course the Junction Butte pack up in Yellowstone National Park, more on them next month, has lots of pups this year. So um, this is always a fun time of year to see all those little itty bitty wolf pups running and romping around. So thanks very much for asking about that. <laughs> GN says, hello, Orca Meow. I'm so impressed you guys remember that her name is Orca. I think maybe her food bowl might be empty because she's definitely meowing during this month's broadcast. I'm sure now that we've mentioned her, she's not going to meow anymore. But briefly, just a couple of minutes ago, she actually walked behind me. I don't know if anybody saw it. It might have been below the view of the camera, but she's definitely roaring around. Linda asks, do the wildlife hunt for morels? Yes, they do. It is an important food source for lots of different animals, including bears. Um, obviously anything else like, like going for berries or going for morels, you always want to do it really sustainably. I try really hard to take just a few from each area, um, both to, um, allow for other people to enjoy morels, but also other animals to enjoy morels too. There's a way for humans to harvest morels and leave enough for the animals behind. Just like there's a way for humans to harvest huckleberries and make sure you're leaving some behind on the bush for wildlife and birds as well. So great question. Don asks, any mountain lion sightings around the elk refuge this year yet? Don, this is kind of not um, historically the time of year when we would see them. There was, of course, that one year when we did have that female mountain lion with kittens, which was really extraordinary. We've certainly seen some in summer with kittens, uh, but historically we actually have better success um, more towards the fall. So I have no doubt um, in fact, I'm quite aware based on research that there's quite a few mountain lions in that area, particularly once you go up the Grovant drainage, uh, but no sightings so far this year. Great question. Let's see here. Oh, Fred, thank you very much. I was talking about that woman getting charged by that grizzly with cubs right by Roaring Mountain. That is correct. Thank you. Pamela says, I'm amazed at how well 399 is still hunting. Have you noticed any slowing down with her and her age? In short, no. She's got to be arthritic. She's got to be a little sore. It's got to be a lot to feed all of those guys. But I have to say, in all the bears I've been fortunate enough to witness over, you know, the short period of time that I've been in this industry, um, short period of time in terms of the amount of time we've known about bears in the West, but relatively long period of time, right? 15, 18 years, something like that. She's by far and away the best at hunting elk calves. And what's interesting is, is even her, her young sub-adults and, you know, uh, cubs under the age of five are all way better than the average adult bear of 10 or even 15 years. She's such a good teacher at, at uh, teaching grizzly bears how to hunt elk calves in early season, uh, that it really is remarkable. She is better than anyone I've ever seen. Um, she doesn't get them every time, but gosh, she has a higher success rate than any bear I've ever seen. She's really good at it. Um, and you know, remember grizzly bears face a 50% mortality rate under the age of two. And then they face an additional 50% mortality rate of the ones who survive in that sub-adult phase from three to four years of age. So Part of the reason I think she's so successful as a mother is just she's a very good teacher and her cubs tend to do well. But the other reason, of course, is because she's darn good at hunting. She's just really good at getting elk calves. Now, for those of you guys who aren't familiar with grizzly bears and their habits, right as the elk calves are born, they're pretty vulnerable to predation by grizzly bears. And it's an incredibly important food source for them this time of year. This is not a time when there's a lot of greening up of growth. Certainly they can eat grass and glacier lily and Indian potato plant, but not a lot of options available. Hang on. <clears throat> there we go. Sorry, I had to clear my throat there. And, uh, you know, elk calves are an incredibly important part of their diet. So grizzly bear cubs who learn from their mother how to do that tend to be far, far more successful and are able to put on that body fat that, you know, and allows them to have cubs of their own uh, relatively early and younger than bears who have to take years to perfect the art. So, um, gosh, she should be slowed down. But um, she's a little smaller maybe than she was when she was older, when she was younger. But boy, she is just incredibly talented. Pretty awesome that Raph got that great footage. Isn't that amazing stuff, guys? Pretty cool. 
Oh, Laura. She says, why do ermine slash weasels change colors from white in winter to brown in summer? Well, Laura, that's a really good question. Thank you very much. You know, it is a camouflage issue. We have a lot of snow out here in the winter. Far, far easier to escape predators, particularly aerial predators like hawks hunting in the air when you match the snow. But being bright white in the summer certainly isn't going to do you any good at all. And so going ahead and changing to that light brown or golden color as most weasels do, is gonna be incredibly useful for you in the summertime because you're gonna stick out if you're white in the summer and you're gonna stick out if you're brown in the winter. So great camouflage tactic that really increases their odds of survival, pretty awesome. It's actually amazing to me that more mammals don't change color from season to season. You would think, for instance, an elk would be far more successful if it was white in the winter, but there is a theory about that. And it's the same that's the theory about why are zebras striped? which is to say elk being the color they are actually helps them camouflage into themselves because they're a herd animal by all kind of being in a group. It might be hard for a predator like a wolf to differentiate one individual from the other if they're all matching or in the case of zebras, all of those stripes would be really disorienting. Um, something like an ermine is certainly not going to be living in a group and so is more in, in need of that camouflage as it moves individually around because that's gonna attract more attention. So great question. Gosh, Dan, I knew this was going to come up. So I don't have a lot of details for you all other than the official details. But in short, Grizzly Bear 399s has a daughter, and her name is 610. And that daughter had cubs, and those cubs turned two years old this year, and they, she sent them off on their own. There are two cubs. It's hard to say what they are, but the rumor is they're both male. We know at least one of them is. One of those cubs immediately... Um, wandered south of the park and was kind of hanging out in the subdivisions south of Grand Teton National Park. It was moved all the way up, I believe, to the Yellowstone boundary, but I'm not super confident on that, out into the wilderness to try and hope that it would not be human habituated, it would stay away from people, and it wouldn't feed on human resources. Unfortunately, it came right back down, uh, came back down south, and was in a neighborhood nearby where previously um, a woman in violation of local wildlife ordinances had actually fed grizzly bears. So basically because this human had fed molasses enriched grain to grizzly bears, uh, this bear was choosing to come down into an area that it normally naturally wouldn't go. There's not a lot of food opportunities. It did find some bird feeders in that area nearby and was making use of those bird feeders. Uh, people don't think of grizzly bears eating bird seed, but of course that's wonderful protein. Sunflower seeds, that'd be awesome for an omnivore. And Wyoming Game and Fish at that point made a decision because it had already been moved um, to go ahead and euthanize that bear. So sort of a 399 grand cub, I guess would be the best way to put it. Definitely People are very upset about this. Uh, Wyoming Game and Fish has certainly come out and, and said, look, we, we're not in the business to be killing bears. We, we all love bears. We don't want to be going around and euthanizing them. It's very unfortunate what's happened. Unfortunately, there is no state law in Wyoming that prohibits the feeding of wildlife. Uh, the federal government was going to press charges against this woman who was feeding bears, including 399 and her cubs. But she claimed that she was feeding elk and moose, which is legal under Wyoming law, and that the grizzlies just happened to be hanging out and eating too, but that that wasn't her primary intention. Grizzlies, of course, are a threatened species. They're managed by the federal government, and it is illegal to feed them. But under state law, it's legal to feed elk and moose. And because her intention was elk and moose, the federal government felt like they couldn't press charges. There is local Teton County rules about feeding wildlife, and it is prohibited, but they don't really have a way to enforce that. So unless we're able to change state law, or were able to enforce local county ordinance. Um, unfortunately, this, this woman is not terribly restricted from doing this again. And she has sort of a habit of stopping for a little while when she gets into a trouble and then kind of going back into it. And so while I don't wholly blame this bear's death on the feeding incidents from one human, I'm sure there's more to it than that. It is unfortunate. And it's a great reminder to all of us that we definitely want to lock up our dog food and outdoor food attractants and garbage and that we definitely want to take care uh making sure to put our bird feeders out of reach of bears if you want more information about that there's great information on the wyoming game and fish wildlife uh site there's also great information 
Um, there's a wonderful book about it, but it's also online called Who Ate the Backyard by the Jacksonville Wildlife Foundation, talking about how to have bird feeders. You can certainly have bird feeders in your backyard in, in bear country, but you need to have them um, high enough that the bears can't reach, usually up on a steel pole, and far enough away from any branches or other objects that the bears can use to get to the feeders, so that the feeders are meant for the birds and not for the bears. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot more questions about that. I don't have a lot more than the official details. Certainly unfortunate. I greatly, greatly enjoyed watching that cub grow from infancy into sub-adulthood. I had good wishes for it. Um, I'm sure many of you guys who watched this broadcast saw lots and lots of footage of it, particularly over the last two years. And so we are all very saddened here that this has occurred, but hopefully we can all use it as a lesson and incentive to try and do better by bears in the future. So hopefully that answers that question for you. Let's see here. Bonnie asks, how's 399 and the Fab Four doing? They're doing great. They're hanging out in uh, the northern half of Grand Teton National Park, as they traditionally do this time of year. And they all look great. All of them are doing really well. Uh, certainly, there have been a lot of bear jams. People are very excited to see them. And uh, we talked a little bit about ethical distances and, and people keeping their distance. Sometimes people get so excited they've never seen a grizzly bear before. They're not always thinking about what's in the bear's best interest. Sometimes they're thinking about what's in their best interest. Um, and the growth of sort of cell phones has contributed to that trend. Luckily, we've got the Wildlife Bear Brigade, Wildlife Brigade up in Grand Teton that works really, really hard to keep both bears and people safe. And we're certainly grateful for them. Just a reminder, always want to stay 100 yards away from any bear, but they're doing really well. Thanks for asking. Let's see here. Will 399 get numbers and be tracked over the years, these cubs? Um, often. You know, they don't have a hard rule about it. But the cubs of habituated bears uh, oftentimes do get radio collars and numbers, at least when they're young, just because as uh, grizzly bears grow, the time when they get in most conflict with people, when they're most likely to get into human garbage or food or, gosh forbid, you know, decide that cattle are a source of food, which happens, it's rare, but it does happen, uh, is in their subadult phase. That's when they're about three to four years old. Uh, I, I think you might have heard me say earlier, grizzly bears, you know, the cubs have a 50% mortality rate. And then of those that survive, 50% more of them have, um, are killed um, or die uh, when they're three to four years old because it's hard to be a bear. You have to find an enormous number of food resources. You've got to get your body fat. And of course, if you are raised nearby people, sometimes you're more likely to get yourself in trouble with people. If you're not as afraid of people, you're more likely to, for instance, go into a neighborhood and feed on a bird feeder. Uh, so they like to keep track of those cubs, just like this cub of six tens was collared. I shouldn't say cub, sub-adult. It wasn't a cub. It was a teenager. Uh, and oftentimes that is the case. Uh, but some of them don't, you know, always keep the collars for a long period of time. Um, they'll do it for a little while till they're past the sub-adult phase and then they won't recollar them after that. So great question. So Libby, this is a great question. What can be done to help residents understand how important it is not to feed wildlife? You know, the best way to convince people not to feed wildlife is for people who they care about to make it clear that it's not acceptable to them. So if somebody is feeding wildlife, it's for one of three reasons. It's either because they honestly, truly think that they're helping wildlife. There is very few examples of wildlife that are helped by feeding. A great example of this is if you are to feed elk or moose in the dead of winter, it seems like you're doing them a favor, but in fact, you're not. You're disrupting the bacterial balance in their rumen, in their gut. And when the bacteria that they need to break down those dry grasses and difficult to forage foods are destroyed by an overgrowth of bacteria from easy food resources like, you know, cracked corn or molasses enriched grain, um, that can actually be very, very harmful for them and can do more harm than good because they're no longer able to digest those natural foods and that food source may not necessarily be stable that they're receiving. And so I think people think they want to help, you know, they want to they want to help the cute fuzzy animals and, and wild animals are built and designed to be wild and eat wild foods. And almost always when you choose to feed wildlife, it does more harm than good. Um, Bringing deer down into your neighborhood encourages predation from things like mountain lions. Once those mountain lions come into neighborhoods in places like Colorado and Utah, they're euthanized. The only reason they were there was because people were feeding deer. 
Um, it's not the mountain lion's fault that they were following their food source and that their food source decided to move into a neighborhood. But the consequences are pretty dire for that mountain lion. So lots and lots of examples of when it's not in the best interest to feed wildlife. Um, and the second time, the second reason that that happens is that people don't care what the science says. They want to do what they want to do. And social encouragement, sort of social dissuasion is the best way to handle that. If everyone around you says that that's really not great that you're doing that, it's probably going to make a way bigger difference than anything some scientist or me or anybody says about why it's good or bad to feed wildlife. If you've got a friend feeding wildlife and you explain all this and just say that, you know, you're not, you're not up for it and you don't think it's a good idea, that's probably going to have a bigger impact. So great question. I really appreciate that. All right. Awesome, guys. I think I got all of the questions. I'm super psyched. Uh, super fun to talk to everybody. I've missed you guys. Have you missed me? It's been super fun. Uh, I hope to see everybody next month, first Wednesday, 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time of every month. I hope you all have a wonderful, wild month, and we'll see you all soon. So long.